Welcome back, everybody. I'd now like to introduce Matthias Mann. He is the professor and director of the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Germany, and also the director of Novo Nordisk, sorry, Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Protein Research at the University of Copenhagen. And today he's going to be presenting on single cell-based analysis of cancer and host proteome interactions by deep visual proteomics. Welcome, Matthias. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, can you can you see my screen? Okay, good. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. It's uh, been a fascinating meeting already, and. Um, um, I want to contribute a, a proteomic angle to, to this and uh, how we can now study um, uh, directly uh, cancer heterogeneity at, at the cellular level. So that's uh, very new uh, developments. So it's mainly a technological talk and um, hopefully it will be interesting to you to see what's um, coming up as, as far as possibilities. So um, uh, proteomics, um, uh, can in principle, or that's the aim at least, that it can look at uh, proteins at a large scale and uh, can look at also the modifications of proteins where they are in the cell uh, and so on. And I think the technological advances have been just as spectacular as in genomics. It just started uh, from a much lower base, so it will take a while until we get to the numbers that you know from genomics. So this is our setup. So we've been uh, busy with our um, developments for many years. And, um, and basically have to do three things. So we have to um, extract our proteins from a source, such as a tumor material, uh, then um, um, efficiently process it, and then do the mass spec measurement. So that's what I'm talking about here, mass spec based proteomics uh, in, a, um, in an efficient way. Uh, so we have two platforms for this, uh, which I'll come into. And then we have to analyze all this data um, which is also very big data uh, with uh, bioinformatics methods. So we've been uh, studying mainly, mainly cellular biology questions in the past and, uh, and now more and more we're getting into um, clinical applications. So uh, this is um, to show you that the technology is indeed coming of age. So this is from a um, paper this year uh, where we actually took uh, 100 genomes uh, across the, all the kingdoms of life and, and measure their proteomes. And this is the technology we used. Uh, and then uh, we actually doubled uh, the number of proteins that there's experimental evidence for uh, in this one study. And we can also say very generally what uh, what is um, uh, the end product of, of um, gene expression cascade. You know, what is that actually quantitatively? And it turns out that, for instance, one of the main functions is to maintain uh, the proteome in a functional state uh, itself. So that was one of the take-home messages of that study. But today I want to talk about uh, clinical applications. So one of the things we do is analyze the plasma proteome. Uh, and this is a review. So um, uh, this is the plasma proteome with a very large dynamic range. Uh, and we would like to analyze the, the entire range with the mass spectrometry, but that's not yet possible. Um, uh, but uh, we are covering this higher range here already. Uh, and this is what these proteins do depending on their abundance. Uh, and this is from the hospital here in Munich where I am. So there's uh, nine, over 9 million lab tests. And uh, most of them are actually uh, things that mass spec should and could and should analyze. And that's uh, proteins uh, and also small molecules. And I would argue it's better with um, mass spectrometry because it's super um, specific. And then you also have a test like once and for all because you could, in theory, measure all the reagents um, all together, which are measured one at a time today. So this is um, in a review. Uh, we've uh, said why this hadn't, hasn't been such a great success before and, and how it's now changing. And um, I won't talk about it. So this is our workflow now, uh, which is quite robust and fast. Uh, and um, we've actually now, for the first time, in the case of liver disease, uh, uh, we, we are better at diagnosing uh, than, than the standard test uh, or the best in class test that people are using now. And that's a very large unmet clinical need, actually. 
So then we want to be able to say what, what is the health state of the person from the plasma proteome. So um, that's, um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So today I want to introduce some um, very cool new technology. So this happens to be from Bruca actually. Um, but um, so we, we've worked with Bruca for more than five years now. And this is the cross section of this instrument. And the details are not important, but it uses quadruple time of flight technology with the uh, crucial ingredients here, which is eye mobility, which gives us a 50 fold uh, increase in um, uh, in the signal to noise, and that makes many of these things possible that I'm going to talk about. So this is this passive method that we um, developed on, on that instrument and together with Buka, and uh, again this gives us um, a, a super high sensitivity, which we'll need for looking at um, very small amounts. So um, you've seen this kind of slide uh, before. And uh, this usually uh, used to introduce the necessity or desirability of uh, single cell analysis at the transcriptome level or the genome level. Uh, but arguably that's, that would be even better uh, if you could study the proteome at that level because we would actually, uh, if we could, especially if we could um, preserve the, the spatial information. So we heard about immuno-oncologies uh, now, so we would like to know you know, what is the proteome of cells that are surrounded by T cells versus um, proteome of cells that are not surrounded by T cells, for instance. And also we would like to know um, the, um, the proteome around, you know, that what's not even in cells, but what's around cells. So this uh, was always desirable, but never possible. Uh, and now it is becoming possible. So here we use uh, fact sorting to know that, that we actually have uh, one cell or, or, or a number of cells, and then we use a platform consisting of this uh, HVLC instrument called Evocep and uh, the Buka, and this is spearheaded by Andreas and Marvin here. Uh, and um, what we want to do is analyze actually single cells, uh, and this is research in progress, so it involves um, uh, Bruca instruments that are not on the market and also HVLC instruments that are not on the market. Um, so um, from the Bruca instrument, this special one, we actually get then a, a five times higher signal intensity that's illustrated here and here. Um, so that's essential. Uh, and then from then we need to prepare the single cells without losing them. And that's uh, on this platform called Evocep. And this is my disclaimer. I'm an indirect investor in this company. So uh, details are not so important, but we can very efficiently uh, prepare the single cell on top of an Evo tip here, and then we can el elude it in only 20 nanoliters and push it out in this special chromatography setup uh, very robustly with a very low flow rate, like lower than 100 nanoliters per minute. So that's what we do. And then um, uh, we actually, so this is a signal for when we just put one cell into the mass spectrometer, and here is the um, MSMS signal, so we can actually get fragmentation data. So I should also say in passing that there have been single cell reports for um, mass spectrometry uh, for uh, based proteomics, uh, but these were actually using a trick. So they actually were, they were actually still introducing hundreds of cells uh, into the mass spectrometer, but but labeling them in a clever way. So, uh, but that makes it very hard to be quantitative. So this is actually one cell, and here is uh, the data. So we prepared zero cells by fax or one cell. Uh, or two and so on, and you can see that we get more and more proteins. So at the moment, uh, this was at a thousand cells for, for one cell prepared with facts, and, and then it goes up, um, but this is a moving target. So, uh, and, and what's very important also conceptually is the quantitative aspect. So we can uh, here compare um, bulk preparations of, um, of cellular proteomes, and, and we get a, a, a nice Pearson correlation coefficient here. And then we go only to eight cells. Um, we also have a nice uh, Pearson correlation, but but this is very interesting. So if you have one cell and um, quantitate its proteome against another cell, you still get a very high uh, quantitative accuracy. And this is in contrast to transcriptomics, not of any technological, not because of any technological limitations, but because uh, you have shot noise. So the, the single cell doesn't need all the messages all the time. So it doesn't actually express them, uh, but it does need a fun functional proteome. So presumably every single cell is a quite complete proteome, but this wasn't actually known before. And now we, um, we can actually show this. 
And if this is all true, we should also be able to see uh, some biological regulations in single cells. And this is out of the press, um, or not even of the press. Uh, this is out from the lab. So here uh, we have a number of cells, so 92 single cells. So we can do them about half an hour, one single cell proteome. And then we have here um, a HeLa cells that we've arrested and, um, and then, then fact sorted. And we had quite good um, data completeness with a technology called DIA Parsev. Uh, and then indeed in the principal component analysis, we see uh, that we have several populations um, that, that, that uh, later out turn out to be different in the cell cycle. So we, we do see the um, cell cycle proteins here in, in the single cells um, that should allow us to assess the cell cycle. And then indeed, if we, if we do the matrix here, we, uh, we see um, uh, enriched by, um, by bioinformatics, we see enrichment of pathways that uh, point to S phase for these cells uh, or G phase so, or, or G2, G2 M phase transition. So this is actually possible. It's not exactly how we want to do this because we lack the barcode that uh, George Church was talking about. Um, so, uh, but, but this shows that we can actually have the sensitivity of a single uh, cell. So now how do we want to study cancer? That's shown here. So we use uh, deep learning. So this upper part here is, uh, or this part here is what's also known as digital pathology. So we, um, um, uh, so, so we take uh, FFPE tissue or um, FFPE embedded uh, tissue and we look at it with um, uh, uh, high content uh, imaging. And then uh, we use an AI to segment the cells, either we teach it uh, what, what cells we want or we uh, let it decide itself. And then we have a special laser dissection micro, uh, microscope where we then cut out these uh, coordinates from a particular class. And then we use the setup I just showed you uh, to, uh, to get the proteome. And then um, we hope this will be a, a resource uh, for researchers and also for clinicians. So, and that's Andreas and Fabian that, um, that are spearheading that in my Copenhagen uh, group. So, and this, this is actually a teamwork. So this is from Peter Horvath uh, in Hungary. So he's one of the leaders in image segmentation by uh, deep learning. And then uh, our labs in Copenhagen and in Munich. And then also um, uh, a team from Leica uh, because the hardware of, of the LCN had to be changed. So, um, so we have a history in uh, looking at uh, uh, cancer, especially ovarian cancer by proteomics. And here are some of, of the um, papers here. Um, and for instance, um, here, uh, this is a paper that came out uh, last year. Uh, we actually separately cut out, but this is micro dissection, uh, the tumor uh, um, of, of uh, in ovarian cancer over several stages, uh, but also the stroma here. And in this paper, um, you can read uh, that, that the target then turned out to be in the stroma. And that's sort of what you would want because um, the stroma is, uh, you know, is not, uh, it's not so easy for the stroma to mutate away as it is uh, for, the, uh, for the tumor as we, as we heard this morning already. So, um, and then what can we now do with this technology? So this is the library gland and uh, we are using this um, deep learning with uh, star transfer and so on from the Peter Horvath group. Uh, and now it's color coded it uh, in different colors. And this is from ovarian cancer. And again, from our collaboration with Ernst Lenghi from with the University of Chicago. And we can define uh, several cell types or the AI does it. Uh, several cell types uh, based on the um, uh, proteomes, uh, sorry, based on the morphology or uh, also by antibody stage um, staining, uh, we can define what, what cells we want to pick. Uh, and then it will pick uh, the number we specify and put them in a particular well. So this is uh, shown here. So we, um, uh, uh, we cluster these cells and classify them. And then we, um, uh, uh, we actually excise them into uh, particular wells. And we usually do this in the 96 or 384 uh, well format. And this is again the salivary gland that I showed you before. So after classifying, it's then colored it in different colors. And uh, 
this is on the basis of morphological features here. So, um, uh, yeah, so this is um, how this works. So again, every every cell gets the number and the contour, so that's, that's saved, and then it's going to be cut out here. Uh, so it goes uh, pretty fast, so we can actually cut out 30,000 cells per day, so it takes a second or two per, um, per cell. Uh, and then um, we uh, actually get what we call, or what's called biological fractionation. So if we are interested in a particular cell type, uh, then the proteins that are particular for that cell type, they will actually be high in the rank. So this, are, this is the most abundant protein here in that cell type, and it will be the least uh, abundant that we can detect. And then some specific proteins that are known to be characteristic for these cells, they, they're relatively high abundant. And we can see this also in large-scale resources like the Protein Atlas from Sweden, from Emma Lundberg and Matthias Ullin. So, um, um, so that's as it should be. And here's another example from uh, melanoma. So this is um, a, a slice from melanoma tissue, and uh, it's in color. The AI is color coded these different um, uh, cell types here, and we um, we're cutting out the ones associated with uh, uh, with the melanoma. And then if we look in the proteome for that, we see again this biological enrichment, so that the the most abundant proteins um, uh, from that uh, that cell type are actually annotated in the literature as having something to do for with melanoma. Uh, whereas if we had analyzed the bulk uh, proteome, they would be uh, way down here in the uh, in the abundance rank. So now uh, there's actually nothing, nothing is stopping us uh, at, at the single cell level. So we could also uh, look at uh, parts of the cell. So that's what we've done here. So we've cut out actually nuclei versus whole cells. And then we've measured the proteome. So it's not one nucleus and one whole cell, but, but more. Uh, and then if we do the um, proteome and the bioinformatic enrichment, we see uh, uh, we see uh, uh, processes that are um, characteristic of the nucleus here enriched, and uh, what happens in the cytosol is more enriched here or in the plasma membrane. So that's as it should be. And we can do this again for the automatic. So the, the holes here that you see, uh, then the laser has already cut out these um, nuclei and, and the other contours, it's, it's going to cut out in a minute. So this is again, uh, so you have actually quite a number of uh, nuclei in the field of view, uh, and uh, it, it could uh, also look uh, for very rare events, so very um, like gigantic cells that we heard about this morning, or, or cells that are somehow communicating with each other or are surrounded by T cells, as I mentioned before. So here we've asked uh, um, we've asked the AI to classify, so these are U2S cells in this case from cell culture, and we just ask it uh, just classify uh, the um, uh, the nuclei into five different um, into five different classes as best you can. So we don't know what they are. So it's just giving them different colors here, and you can see some are bigger than others perhaps, and uh, others have a different shape. Um, uh, from the others, and then uh, cut them out, and then we analyze them. And indeed, lo and behold, in the PCA, we, we see that their proteomes also cluster in the same groups. Uh, so they have distinct proteomes, right? And, um, and then if we then actually do uh, the um, uh, uh, bioinformatic analysis again, we see that um, uh, uh, we see that um, uh, this is actually uh, the cell cycle, right? So uh, this is again the cell cycle. So we see that the different classes in the first instance um, uh, reflect different uh, different stages of the cell cycle. Um, but that wasn't clear to me when I looked at the cells. Uh, and also, even in this very simple exercise, we found some uh, novel reading frames that hadn't been associated with a particular cell cycle stage, but now we are very sure that they actually are. Um, so then again, we can put this together with um, uh, with large scale imaging resources such as uh, Emma's uh, Emma Lundberg's um, subcellular atlas, which I already mentioned. And for instance, one of these open reading frames or one of these proteins here, um, uh, we see it. Um, so it was also in U2S cells heterogeneous ex heterogeneously expressed in in cell culture here, uh, and we see it also heterogeneously expressed in nuclei, just like this resource, so that's good. 
And so, but this also illustrates that, that we can then, in a large scale fashion, associate uh, the proteomes of these different cell types uh, with, uh, uh, with the imaging information that we have. So, um, so then that, um, if you want to be a little bit more uh, conceptual about it, then uh, the proteomics will give us individual proteins that are different in different conditions. And then, um, uh, and, and this could always be associated with the imaging information here from resources like the protein atlas. So that's, um, um, that's what we're doing now, uh, also in ovarian cancer and in various forms of, of ovarian cancer and other cancers. And um, this is also, um, so there's also an explosive development of technologies in imaging. And for instance, uh, here we've now, uh, we're in the process of doing this uh, three-dimensional. So we can, uh, so of course the cutting out will always be from the top, uh, but we can classify the cells much better uh, when we have them in, in three dimensions, which is shown here. Uh, and again, we can also, um, look at things like uh, the spatial aspect that I mentioned, like this cell is close to this cell. So what are they doing here, right? Is this just a mechanical support for the other cells or is this maybe a conduit to, um, um, to exchange uh, cytosol between these cells? Nobody knows, but we can now uh, cut this out and see what proteins are involved, right? So this is, this is definitely possible now. Okay, uh, with that, I want to acknowledge my groups and uh, uh, a very fruitful collaboration with Buka on the Marsbeck side. Uh, this is our handle if you want to follow us. And uh, I should acknowledge the um, Center for uh, Protein Research by the Novo Nordisk Foundation, uh, Peter Horvath, uh, and also Evosep for, um, for the uh, low flow HPLC. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks so much, uh, Matthias, for that uh, tremendous presentation. Uh, really, really exciting work. And um, uh, let me just take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Jeff Townsend. I'm a biostatistician and evolutionary biologist at Yale and have the pleasure of moderating these Q&A questions for the second half of today's talks. Um, and I just wanted to pass on a, a first question to you, which is just um, that, uh, of course, in this uh, context of trying to understand cancer and evolution, the kind of diversity of different cells that you see on a single cell level within cancer is critical to understanding how cancer cells are evolve and cancer tumor, tumors evolve over time. Uh, what have you What have you thought about in terms of? I know this is a very nascent technology, but in terms of trying to characterize that diversity and pass that on to a user working with these kinds of tools, so that they can understand, uh, you know, what kind of things might be heritably uh, different and therefore determine the future evolution of cancer tumors uh, with these technologies. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, I think our main role is to develop this technology and then we and others can use them. Um, but uh, we have, of course, thought about it. So we are doing, um, we are actually studying actual cancer patients with them. So we, we are trying to uh, look at their um, evolution because you, you get actually that evolution in a single slice, right? Because you have normal appearing cells and sort of on the way and uh, and more uh, morphologically uh, um, cells that are uh, looking more de-differentiated and we can sort of follow that in a single slide, which we do, and we could come up with uh, proteins that are overexpressed that may be uh, targets. So we've done that a number of times in uh, um, so single patient cases. Uh, you could imagine, I think, um, uh, you could imagine um, uh, an actual cancer test uh, that is, um, you know, uh, so for instance, in prostate cancer or many forms of breast cancer, uh, you, you want to know not only that you have it, but how likely are you to progress and it's going to be aggressive. So the jury's out, but, but I think this is as good as any technology to see, you know, which class you are. Um, so that, that's, um, uh, yeah, that's a direction. And then, uh, yeah, just studying the, the heterogeneity and just basic biology about how they maybe communicate. There's a lot of different theories about it, and we can maybe rule out some or, uh, or, or support others. So that's, um, I think the sky's the limit here. Tremendous. Um, great. So uh, I'm just wondering, uh, as we've sort of seen a lot of developments in terms of single cell genome sequencing, some single cell RNA sequencing, uh, along with the uh, 
program that you talked about. Are there uh, available, are there ways that you've thought about integrating these different single, single cell technologies into like single assays that then could be tremendously useful across technologies? Yes, absolutely. So the easiest would be um, like um, with genomics, you get a set of uh, mutations or so driver mutation, whatever mutations. So then uh, uh, we know what's the background, right? I mean, what mutations uh, are there in the tumor altogether? And then we can maybe relate that to our single cell proteomics data. Uh, what, but what would be even more exciting would be um, to uh, um, uh, cut out these different classes, right? And then maybe uh, the different classes have different genomic background, right? And uh, we have actually done this now for um, um, so-called ovarian cancer of dual origin. And we have, uh, 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 we have seen this that we can actually see at the proteomic level, so we can see the actual mutations. Um, so we can uh, relate, uh, you know, the genom genomic changes. So of course, in our case, it's very crude, but it's uh, enough to to say this, uh, you know, this type of, of cells, this class, uh, you know, is that genotype, and that class is another genotype, right? And then we can see what functional consequence that has, or maybe it has, it looks like it has no functional. Um, uh, consequence. So that, that I think is uh, um, maybe the biggest contribution here in, in, need to, in the near term of putting the genomics together with the proteomics. Great. Um, one more sort of technical, technological combination question. Of course, we're all looking forward very much to getting these single cell technologies uh, up and running in such a way that we can basically use them for most of our assessment of uh, genotypes because the typical bulk sequencing approaches uh, you end up looking at combinations of genotypes of multiple cells, which becomes a challenging prospect mm -hmm. for convolution, sometimes even impossible. Um, nonetheless, the technologies for bulk sequencing are quite well developed out there right now. So um, what about com combining this with bulk sequencing in some ways? Are there ways that these two can be brought together to provide more knowledge than just one alone might produce? Yeah, so um, yeah, again, so we have done this also with, with some of these um, case studies um, where, um, you know, um, uh, people had already done um, the sequencing and then, then found some actual mutations. Uh, but of course, we see, the, uh, we see the cases where they haven't found those. And we, uh, you know, in one cancer we saw, um, I mean, they had, they had seen a mutation that they had uh, not um, called actionable uh, because that mutation belonged to another cancer, but then we also saw it at the proteome level and then that together, they said that was okay. And now they, um, now they want to treat um, uh, along those lines. So, so just having the two technologies overlap uh, helped in that case. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks so much for bringing us up to date on these uh, really outstanding technologies.